Well, this morning we're in our uh, third message in a series uh, called Go Tell It, Share the Gift. The first week, if you remember, two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' calling of the first disciples and that he called them uh, to, to be with him, to be like him, to imitate him, to think like him, much like young Jewish men were called to follow rabbis in that day. These men were called to do the things that he did. He called them to follow him or to uh, be with him. And you remember we looked and saw that part of being with him was becoming fishers of men, being men who had spread the message of the gospel. Appreciate Pastor Curtis filling in for me last week and leading you through the healing of the paralytic. Uh, you remember that his, fr his friends had to bring him to Jesus. He could not come uh, to Jesus on his own, but they had to bring him to Jesus in order for him to be healed uh, both physically and also spiritually. And, and Curtis last week really drove home the point for us that we need to remember the importance of being a person who serves others well. As we serve others well, it offers us the opportunity to bring them to Christ and to share with them the gospel message. Now, let me just mention, it may seem odd to you or to some of you that we're talking about the personal responsibility of sharing the gospel during the Christmas season. Uh, you might think, you know, I expected to come to church during the Christmas season and hear a message about the birth of Jesus because it's Christmas time, right? Well, you know, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus as disciples of Christ, as followers of Christ, first of all, it's good for us to be reminded of what his coming means to us. And as we give uh, thoughtful gifts at Christmas to those that we love, how much more important is it for us to think of those who need to know the ultimate gift in, in the coming or in the birth of Christ? Now, this morning, as we continue our series, I'm going to invite your attention to a very strange passage at Christmas time. I'm going to invite your attention to Luke chapter 16, and in just a moment, we'll be jumping in at verse 19 and reading through uh, the end of the chapter. By the way, I, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned to you I like to keep you updated on theological developments. And uh, why are you all laughing? <laughs> and, you know, a lot of study has been done. When the wise men came to see Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, one of the gifts they gave was, was gold. And for centuries we've wondered what, what was done with the gold? What, what did the gold do? And evidently uh, it's come to light recently that Mary used the gold to pay the little drummer boy to stop. <laughs> That's not, okay, look. I was gonna say I missed you guys last week, but I, I'm not going there now. <laughs> rough, rough crowd. All right, as you turn to the passage, if you have uh, headings in different sections of scripture and you see the story we're looking at this morning, I, I hope you have this thought. Why would the preacher preach this passage during the Christmas season? This is really strange. Listen, I want you to think it's really strange. In fact, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that tomorrow as you go to work or to school or as you're in your neighborhood and you encounter people that also go to church and they ask you, well, how was your service yesterday? I hope you tell them, man, it was really strange. The message was just a bizarre message at Christmas time. And I hope you recount the message for them because here's what I hope happens. I hope the message that we're looking at today, every Christmas season, comes back to your mind. I, I don't mind if you think it's really strange and really bizarre to preach this passage at Christmas time. I want you, the, the strangeness of this message, to always stick with you. What's it about? It's about a man who, who misses Christmas. He doesn't miss Christmas because he wasn't invited to the party. He doesn't, he doesn't miss it because he doesn't have the opportunity to receive the true gift of Christmas. He misses Christmas for the same reason a lot of people miss it today. He misses Christmas because he decided he didn't need it. It wasn't for him. He could just skip it. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. Hey, by the way, I went to Walmart yesterday. What a mistake. <laughs> you know, there's enough food just in the local Walmart down the street here to feed about three impoverished nations. Do we really eat that much at Christmas time? I mean, because I don't see it like that during the year. Okay, uh, verse 20 rich man. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. 
The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, you probably know this, but Jesus spoke about hell more than heaven. In fact, Jesus spoke about hell three times more often in Scripture than he spoke about heaven. And and what we just read is probably the clearest passage depicting hell. It's a testimony of what it's like to to be in hell, and it's not found anywhere else in Scripture. You know, in Matthew 25, Jesus was warning the Pharisees and others who were playing the religious game, he was warning them that a great judgment was coming. And that that judgment, God would separate the sheep from the goats. Some would go to everlasting life, some to everlasting torment. And now in this parable that Jesus tells is a picture of what it's like to be in everlasting torment. What does it say? Well, the rich man, it says, habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. He, he had the finest, uh, most expensive garments that you could wear. He regularly put himself and his wealth on display every day. It was a big deal to him for people to know that he was a big deal. He lived lavishly. Every day was a party or a feast. And this rich man had the resources to obtain anything he wanted. Every day was an ostentatious, uh, lavish, luxurious event. And at his gate, we see was a poor man. He happens to be named. His name is Lazarus. He's covered in sores. He has nothing. He lives in extreme poverty. He's gross. He's filthy, dirty, unkempt. And he has these open sores, oozing sores all over his body. Evidently, he's crippled because it tells us that he was laid at the man's gate. Literally, the Greek word is dumped. Somebody at least had enough compassion on him to dump him at the rich man's gate and hope that the rich man might do something to benefit him or or to care for him. And if you look in verse 21, it says very simply, all he desired was this, to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Now, let me, let me clarify what fell from the rich man's table. Sometimes you read that and think it's, it's crumbs. Now, unless you have a lot of kids in your home, there's probably not a lot of crumbs that fall to the floor, at least not enough to sustain someone. What happened at the rich man's table was they didn't have, uh, they didn't use napkins back then. They would come to the table and you ate with your fingers and you might dip your fingers in some fluid that was, food that was pretty uh, runny that had liquid in it or you might dip your fingers in, in olive oil. And so what you did to wipe your hands off was you took a chunk of bread and wiped your hands and threw it under the table, threw it on the floor. All Lazarus wanted was what fell from the rich man's table, but the rich man didn't even extend that courtesy to the beggar. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this point because I don't want to gross you out, but this phrase, dog came and licked his sores, dogs were not domesticated at this time for the most part. So what's happening here is mongrels, a pack of mongrels that probably wandered the city, were attracted to the rotting flesh on Lazarus' body, and they came and chewed on those sores. Listen, to the rich man, this beggar is nothing more than roadkill. Think about day in and day out as he goes in and out from his place, as guests come for all the lavish parties and feasts that he throws, the beggar is there, and yet nothing is done for him. Think about the contrast between these two men. One is poor, the other is rich. One's on the outside, the other's on the inside. One has nothing to eat, the other has plenty. One has great needs, the other has no need. One is in the company of dogs, 
the other in the company of dignitaries. One suffers, the other is satisfied, one's humiliated, the other is honored, one seeks help, one gives no help. But an event happens that changes everything. And let me just pause here and say this. If you're one who has suffered a great deal in life, it doesn't matter if you suffer every day of your life if you know Christ. Because the moment you step across the threshold from time into eternity, none of that will even be remembered. Look what happened. Verse 22, this event changed everything. The poor man died and the rich man also. The poor man died and the rich man also. It says when the poor man died, he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And just for simplicity, let me just tell you, he was, he was in heaven. He was in paradise at that point. There's no mention of a funeral or a burial for the poor man. Typically, that would not happen for a poor man. Typically, what would happen for a beggar like this is the, he, pro, he may have died right out there outside the gate of the rich man, but the garbage collectors would come and pick up that body and throw it in Gehenna, which was the trash heap outside Jerusalem that continually burned with fire. That's probably what happened to his body. The rich man, on the other hand, we're told that he died and was buried. Why? He was respected and honored. He probably had a very lavish funeral. The, the more wealth you had, the more money you had to hire mourners, the more mourners you had. Obviously, the, the greater person you were. There were probably many friends around to grieve his loss. But look at the contrast after death. The poor man is now rich. He's on the inside, the guest at a, at a great feast. He has absolutely no need. He is satisfied for eternity. He's honored as a child of God. And the rich man, verse 23 says, he's in hell. And let me point out that he is in hell immediately. Some of you may have come from a religious uh, tradition that teaches there's a transition or there's a waiting place. There's even the, the possibility that after a time there may be a different outcome from your temporary assignment of suffering. That's not what Scripture teaches. There is no waiting place. There's no limbo. There's no purgatory. You remember when Jesus was on the cross and the one repentant thief asked him, remember me, and Jesus said, when? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, this rich man on that very day that he died went to hell, and he is instantly aware that he's in hell. Scripture says here that he is in torment. It's not another opportunity. There's not a waiting place. There's not a chance that you might get out. He is in torment for all of eternity. What do we know? Let me, let me just pause the story here. And, and what do we know about hell from the Bible? Matthew 3 and Matthew 25, hell is an eternal, unquenchable fire. Daniel chapter 12, it's a place of shame and everlasting contempt. Luke chapter 16, where we are, it's a place of torment. Revelation 20, the torment lasts day and night forever. Matthew 22, it's a place of darkness. Matthew 8, it's a place of intense grief. Mark 9, it's a place of terror. Hell is not a, a fictional place in the Bible. It's not an illustration. Hell is real, and hell lasts forever. It's a place of intense physical pain and torment, physically and, and mentally and spiritually. It's a place of sadness and hopelessness. If you ever, when you were in high school or college, um, had the assignment to read Dante's Inferno, which I'm not saying is good theology, but there's at least one good theological point in there, if you remember from Dante's Inferno, over the portal to hell, it says, abandon all hope, you who enter here. It's a place of terror. It's a place of isolation. I, I can't tell you how many times as a student pastor when I'd be trying to share with a young man specifically, sometimes a young woman, about where his life was headed, and he would say to me, hey, I know I'm headed to hell, but that's okay. I'm going to have a great time. All my friends are going to be there. It's going to be a great party. You're isolated in hell. There's no party. There's no fellowship with others. And, and worst of all, hell is a place of separation. 
You're separated from the God who created you and who made you for himself, and you have a void in you that you've had all your life, but now that void is startling, startling real. And you realize you'll be separated from God for all of eternity. Hell is a place that you don't want to go, and you don't want anyone you know to go there. And what you see in verse 23 there's an imaginary conversation that Jesus tells in the story between the rich man in hell and Abraham. And, and by the way, this is one of the ways we know that the story is fictional. People in hell can't see into heaven. But Jesus, in, in telling this story, is giving us a little bit of understanding of what the rich man is going through. The first thing you see is he wants help or he wants relief. Well, that's not going to happen. You know, the toughest question, and it's really a simple question, but the toughest question that people ask about hell, if you're, if you're trying to share with someone and they're hung up on this, uh, on the issue of hell, the toughest question people ask you is, why would a good God, why would a God who's loving, as you say he is, why would he send anyone to hell? Why would he make him suffer like that with no relief? The answer is very simple. God sends no one to hell. God didn't create hell for man. Hell was created for Satan and the, and the demons that, that fell with him. We go to hell on our own volition because we refuse to accept Christ and his payment for our sin. John 3.16 is a verse that we love to quote about how God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. Look at verse 17. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to send people to hell. He came that the world through him might be saved. The world, you and I, were already going to hell when Jesus came. He came that we might be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, for all to have eternal life. The rich man's torment is not going to be relieved ever for all of eternity. Well, in verse 27, he makes a second request, and this maybe is his one redeeming value, one good thing, one act of compassion in his life, even though it's too late. And that is that he doesn't want his brothers to end up in hell. And so he asks that someone, Lazarus, would, it would be sent back from the dead to tell him. He said, look, if you'll send someone back from the dead to warn my brothers, that they'll listen, they'll believe. No, they won't. No, they won't. Do you remember last, uh, last spring when we studied through the book of Acts, we saw repeatedly in the book of Acts that, that miracles validated the message. If you don't believe the message, you just explain away the miracles. Someone coming back from the dead is not going to cause them to believe. They're not going to believe that messenger either. If you look in verse 29, verse 29 tells us why people go to hell. Very simply, they don't listen to the word of God. They don't believe what the Bible says about salvation. They won't repent and believe. They, they, they won't forsake their own ability and their own self-reliance. They won't abandon themselves and come to a true and living God. And some of you today won't either. You're still playing a game. The same religious game that the Pharisees played. Jesus isn't Lord of your life. You haven't surrendered to him. You're a faker. Now, here's the point of the story. Here, here's what I want you to hear today. This is, first of all, not an attack on rich people. I know plenty of people of, of great means who love and, and follow Jesus. This message is not about scaring you into trusting Christ, although some of you need to seriously consider what hell is like. Here's the deal this morning. There are probably a few people in this room and in the venue, there are probably a few people that are headed to hell. And you need to be saved. You need to at least speak with one of our pastors or, or a friend that you know that knows Christ and hear the truth so you can make a good decision about your eternity. And let, let me pause here and mention this. Every service, we want you to have opportunity to respond to what the Word says. Not just those who don't know Christ, but all of us need to respond. And sometimes we need some help and direction in our response. In this service, in this room, at the end of every service, we close with worship, and there are pastors in the front of the, the two outside and the center sections. They're worshiping just like you, but they would long for you to just come in and slip in beside them. You can interrupt their worship if there's something you need to know or a decision you need to make for Christ. There are also pastors in the lobby following the service. I'm over at Guest Central. You're more than welcome to come interrupt me. 
up in the venue, there are pastors at the end of the service. As, as you close in worship, there are pastors there. That's what we're there for. You should never walk out of a place like this having heard the Holy Spirit speak to you and not do something about that decision. We're there to help you. Some of you this morning need to be saved. You need to respond. But, but here's the reality this morning. In this room and in the venue, the vast majority of us who are gathered here this morning already know Christ. We're, we're not headed to hell. Now, we were until we received the message of salvation, until we trusted Christ, we were headed to hell. But you know what? This message about hell this morning, if you're lost, yes, it's for you, but primarily the reason we're looking at this this morning is not for the lost, it's for those of us who already know Christ. What? Why? Why do I need to hear a message about hell? Because like me, you've forgotten what it's like to be headed to hell. You see, we live in a generation of believers that don't want the burden. They, that they don't want to hear a message like this. They don't want the weight and the responsibility that comes with hearing this message. Listen, Jesus is not going to allow a messenger from heaven or hell. Jesus is not going to allow a messenger from hell to come back and warn people. So, so let me ask you to help me with this question this morning. If he's not going to let anyone come back and warn people, who's going to warn people? Who? We are. we are. No one else has that responsibility. We have the responsibility. Listen, the angels don't have the responsibility. They're not going to magically appear to people and, and, and warn them. That's not their job. It's our job. We all have friends, possibly family members, coworkers, classmates, neighbors who are headed to hell. Now, they may not be as mean as this rich man. They may not be as self-centered as this rich man. They may not be as godless as this rich man, but if they don't have a relationship with Jesus, they're going to hell. If, the, if, if they haven't heard the truth and responded to the truth, they're going to hell. How will they hear the truth? From us. Oh, well, there's all kind of preachers on television. There's all kind of preachers on the radio. Sure. And there are people who stumble across that and hear the message and respond. But the most effective method of sharing the gospel is one-to-one. -one. It's relational. It's not typically going to happen that someone just hears a message out of their context because they're in their car, on their television, surfing. That typically doesn't happen. It happens most effectively when we speak the truth. Listen, you can't just look at a person's life and assume, well, you know what? They're, they're a good person. I'll bet they're okay. There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. There might be more good people in hell than evil people in hell because there's a lot of good people that don't know Jesus. You might look at the life of that friend or coworker, or that neighbor, and say, well, you know, every once in a while I hear them talk about going to church, and they, they seem to be pretty religious. There's going to be a whole lot of religious people in hell. A whole lot of religious people in hell. Even people that went to church on a regular basis. Even people that were involved in a small group or a Bible study. The only way you can know if a friend or loved one knows Jesus, is to ask them. The only way that you can be sure that they know the truth is to tell them. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. You have got to speak up. You cannot assume anything. You have to ask them if they know the Lord. You have to tell them the truth. Let me, let me remind you of where we're headed. We have a uh, three more weeks in this series, the 22nd, the 29th, January 5th. Here's where we're headed. January 5th, I'm asking you to bring the name of one person. Three years ago, we asked for names to pray for. Some people turned in 10 names. I'm asking you for the name of one person that you would say, I'm not just asking the church to pray for this person to come to Christ and leaving that work and responsibility to them. We're, we're going to pray. We're going to join you in praying for that one person. But please don't turn in a name unless you are committed to doing what you can to speak the truth of the gospel to that one person in 2020. 
It's going to be a partnership. We're going to pray with you, but you can't just sit around and expect it to happen. You've got to ask, and you've got to speak the truth. The rich man is in hell because either he didn't respond or, or he didn't know the truth. Listen, wh- why is this an important word at Christmas time? Because the meaning and message of Christmas is not just a precious baby born in a manger. It's more than that. The, the message of Christmas is that God sent his son, his only son. And Jesus came and he took the full wrath of God on him. He experienced hell for us because of our sin. And he willingly laid down his life so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have a relationship with God, which is what he made us for, and so we could have an eternity in heaven. The gift of Christmas was given to you and given to me so that as a follower of Christ, we could give it to others. That's why we have the gift. Let's suppose that, I I like you guys, okay, but for now, you guys are the outsiders, okay? You're, You're outside our walls, you're outside our faith, whatever. What if we all, because it's Christmas time, we all said, man, we're going to have this incredible party. We're going to celebrate, and word gets out. Word gets out. There's this big party. We call it Christmas. But you're not invited. You remember the hurt of that when you were in maybe middle school or high school? Being left out? Not getting to come to the party? That's not what God intended. What about, let, let's say that you're here and there's a, a far country called the venue. It's in another place. Or if you're in the venue, there's a far country where they speak blended, whatever that is. <laughs> okay, but wherever you are, there's this other people group somewhere away from you. And you know that they need to hear this message. And so you pray, God, please send someone to tell them the message. No. That's why we go. Uh, That's why we give. I think Pastor Jason mentioned the mission offering earlier. The reason that we give is to make sure that they're going to hear the message. But we can't just give. We also have to go, whether it's in another part of the world or across the street or to the desk next to mine, whatever. We have to do it. The reason that we have been given the gift that we celebrate at Christmas is so we can give it to others. I hope that you will forever remember Christmas of 2019 when your crazy preacher didn't preach on the birth of Jesus, he preached on the rich man in hell so that you would not forget that there are people around you that are going to split hell wide open. They may be good people, they may be religious people, but they're going to split hell wide open and it's on me and on you to make sure they know what Christmas is about and they receive the message of the gospel.